Now, I would like to introduce you to a very special guest. And this guest is responsible for the study, the two-year study, computer dynamic analysis that NIST said they were going to do, but as you will find out, did not do. So we have preliminary findings from Professor Leroy Halsey, the chairman of the Civil Engineering Department at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks, a man who has spent 12 years of his life doing, performing forensic structural engineering. When things go wrong, they call him. Well, things went wrong with Building 7, so we're calling him in. Professor Halsey, come on up. <laughs> well, good evening. So I'm happy to be here I'm from, from Alaska, uh, a little cooler where I'm at than with you, uh, but I'm sure it's uh, cool enough for you here. Uh, so this evening I'm going to talk about some of the work that I've been doing on the structural collapse investigation for this building. And so I'll just kind of begin, uh, so I'll give you a little history. On September 11th, 2001, this building uh, endured fires for almost seven hours from the time of the collapse of the North uh, Tower uh, at 1028 uh, in the morning until about 5, 5 20, 52 p.m. in the afternoon when it came down, um, which unfortunately was also my um, wedding anniversary. So the heat from the uncontrolled fires caused the steel beams and girders to thermally expand, uh, leading to a chain of events that caused um, a key structural column to fail. And this is by the NIST report. Uh, so the, this failure of the structural column then initiated a fire-induced progressive collapse of the entire building. So what we're going to do here this evening is we're going to take a look at that scenario and uh, investigate uh, whether that could have actually occurred. So uh, the objectives of this UAF study are to evaluate the findings for the collapse presented by NIST, which I just read to you, uh, what did not cause collapse, uh, then uh, examine progressive collapse mechanisms and then provide a summary of the findings and conclusions. And then uh, this presentation, however, this evening, I will focus on answering the question, did WTC7 collapse due to fire? And provide a bit of a timeline on the rest of the research that we're going to do. So that's kind of what we are here this evening. Um, just kind of go through the scenario to remind you uh, WTC 1 and 2 and 7. Uh, Richard went through it a bit for you as well. Uh, so there's WTC 1 and WTC 2 and then back behind is WTC 7 and you can see it's 47 stories, significantly a smaller building compared to these two. In a, in a more, uh, I guess, planetary view, uh, there's where WTC 7 lands and there you see the aircraft that were coming in to strike 1 and 2 in those directions and and those little um, red dots coming down shows you where the uh, pieces came down from the from the aircraft so okay uh, so this is kind of another a view of what we're at in, in WTC 7 is the study that we're talking about this evening okay <clears throat> let's kind of take a quick look at uh, the building itself the developer uh, was, was started the by Silvertine Properties in 1983 as uh, when construction started. It was completed in 1987. That's significant because when we're doing an investigation like this, we got to know the codes that were being used, know the conditions of uh, the steel that was being manufactured at the time, what was being provided, and uh, all the materials that were going into it. So, so this is, a, is a really an important idea. Uh, to kind of give you an idea that we had to go back, evaluate all of this to make sure that, uh, that what we're using to do the analysis is consistent with what was actually built. Uh, so the height to the roof is about 610 feet. The floors are 47 of them. Uh, Two million square feet is the floor area, so you can imagine that that's a pretty significant amount of space. There was 32 lifts and elevators in this building and the architect was Emory Roth and Sons, and the structural engineer was Erwin Cantor. So it kind of gives you a kind of a historical pattern of who, what went on and what was going on at the time. Uh, 
just to kind of give you a, a view of what was inside that building. And, and so the question is sometimes asking me, why would I even be bothered by this? Well, if we're talking about fire, I had to have some idea of what the combustible boats might have been floor by floor. And so here we can see that Smith Barney occupied, and I've got the reds in here where we're talking about floors 12 and 13. So Smith Barney occupied um, floor 6, 13, and 18 through 46, a lot of the building. Uh, IRS occupied floors 24 and 25, U.S. Secret Service 9 and 10. America, so the red notices financial institutions for primarily, uh, American ba uh, MX Bank International, Standard <coughs> Chartered Bank, and, Pro and Provident Financial Management all were on floor 13. Different Hartford Insurance Group on 19 to 21 and so forth. Securities Exchange Commission also on floor 13. Uh, New York Office of Management. So there's a number of government offices you will also notice on this list, just to kind of give you an idea of what we're here for. So um, the reason I'm so interested in this is because uh, in terms of looking at the fire, uh, I often question where did the combustibles come from? And if it's a financial group, most likely, it's my theory anyway, that most likely most of it would have probably been locked up for the protection of their clients in, a, in, a, in a, some form of a um, fireproof, um, fireproof vault of some kind. So not a lot of combustible paper would probably have been lying around. Even if it was to f be on fire for that length of time is uh, questionable. So our methodology uh, for this study is first we began with a series of erection drawings to develop a virtual structure. That meant we, were, we, we received the uh, structural erection drawings for this project. We didn't have the structural uh, drawings, nor did we have the uh, structural analysis, but we did have the erection drawings. And on the erection drawings, uh, that was basically a shop, set of shop drawings that enabled them, us to see uh, how the thing went together and to have the details of all the connections and the steel and, and uh, quite a bit about uh, the floor system as well. So we developed that in terms of AutoCAD. We're using two programs, uh, actually uh, primarily for the structures. That's SAP 2000. So structural engineers around the country are pretty familiar with SAP 2000. And Abacus, which is a fairly, it's a very sophisticated final element program that if, in case you don't have everything you need in it, you can actually algor add algorithms to it to do a more sophisticated analysis. And also SolidWorks, in which we use that to look at the fire, uh, fire uh, thermal conductivity through the materials when it's subjected to fire and to try to get a handle on exactly what may have transpired from one floor to the next and looking at fire being on the bottom of a floor versus fire, fire being, I mean, underneath the f uh, floor at the ceiling, between the, b uh, below the floor as well as fire on, f on the floor. So, uh, and so through all that, I established a quality control program uh, and developed a, a way to have non-disputable science was my priority. The team meets daily to question and find the findings and formulate an approach for the next step. So since I have two PhD students when I started, now one's graduated and, and leaving, uh, but the other is still a PhD candidate, uh, every day uh, they would come in with uh, their approach to the problem. I would then question them and we would check each other. So it was a question and answer from, from moment to moment until we were sure that the step process that we were at were, was defendable. Then we would go to the next step. Both uh, Dr. Xiao and Mr. Kwan used two different programs to solve the problem. The two different programs were SAP, two, uh, SAP 2000 and Abacus. And so, um, and we used those to check each other. Not only did we check uh, to make sure that we had accurate information into the uh, AutoCAD file, but to ensure ourselves that when we calculated something, it meant that it was correct and it was verifiable. So um, we also, those results were also checked and verified to be consistent with the, the latest literature. And then Dr. Shaw performed analysis using both AutoCAD and Abacus. And so we spent a huge amount of time 
Uh, using this program, it's not easy to use. It's an extremely steep le learning curve, but it's very, very accurate, and it's very, very good for extremely complicated systems. SAP 2000, on the other hand, is an incredibly simple program to use, very powerful, and so it's an easy way to take and check and see if this stuff is, is act actually accurate. Uh, it has limitations that Abacus does not have, uh, but it, it, it will enable us to do uh, progressive analysis, progressive collapses, things like that, and it's fairly, very quick. So my focus was to ensure that we had scientific solutions that are not influenced by previous re research, but uh, simply will give us uh, the accuracy that we're looking for. Once the results are tested, the information will be thoroughly evaluated by our peers and uh, evaluated against published literature. Okay. So the topics that we investigated are as follows. We, we took a look at the material properties that went into this building to make sure that they were reasonable for the time it was built. Uh, so not only did we look at what was there on the drawings, but questioned whether they were in truly what should have been at the time. Uh, we looked at the diaphragm behavior. That's the floor slab that's, framing, that's sitting on top of the, each floor and is tied to the steel framing. So typically, uh, in a building of this type, those concrete floors are, are f very stiff. And so uh, we, we took a long look at how that system went together. For example, did the floor system, was it tied to the framing? Or was it not tied to the framing? More than one way to build these things. Short construction, composite, short construction, non-composite. Unshort construction, composite. Unshort construction, composite. All of that means is if you're taking composite, you're taking the concrete and, and you're putting shear studs to the steel flanges, welding them, and then you're pouring your concrete onto a pre-formed steel, uh, in this case, a fluted system, stay in place forms, and then you pour your concrete and then they have re reinforcing bars in it. So if, it, if it's shored, then you put the shear studs on the steel flanges. If it's non-shored, then you don't do that, and then you expect these two things to act separately. So this was a shored, I mean, this was a, a, a construction that used uh, shear studs on top of the flanges. So they expected it to work together, all right? So, uh, but considering the fact there's a lot of controversy around that whole idea, whoops, something happened here. Let me back up. Uh, considering the fact that uh, the, there's a lot of controversy about the influence of the shear studs versus non-shear studs at the girders, and some people thought there were no shear studs, and others thought there were no shear studs in some areas and not, not in others. Uh, so we just decided to take a look at analyzing it without shear studs, analyzing with shear studs, and then considering that maybe there were some partial effects, and so we looked at it as a partially composite system as well. Um, I hope I'm not uh, being too, too uh, difficult to understand here, but I'm trying to give you a mental picture of this building and its complexity. The framing was very, very complex, but the idea of having these shear studs is kind of an important idea so that the concrete floor slab and the steel structure would then act together. Okay? Now, this equivalent, this concrete uh, deck has a flutes, uh, in other words, there's stay-in-place forms here where they look like flutes. Uh, so if you would imagine that uh, in one direction it's got these flutes that are actually uh, welded to the top of those flanges through those shear studs, and in the other direction it's not uh, flutes at all. So basically it's stiffer in one direction than it is in another. And so to do this analysis, that made a further complication also with the welded wire fabric in there and a the rebar. So we ended up with what, we ended up looking at this using a, an, a, an equivalent concrete deck that would give me the same stiffness, same performance into two different directions and we wouldn't have to go through all those details. If we did, it would take a couple, three more years just to analyze that. So we, 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 what we've done in every step of the way, we've tried to come up with an equivalent system, stiffness system to save uh, the, the 
the time and be able to get results out fairly quickly. And that meant also in substructuring all the connections on every floor. Basically what we did is we looked at every connection as it was built, broke, th broke that out and identified it by approximating it with a series of springs that would give me the same behavior. Then we put that back in and, and solved it. We then also conducted heat transfer looking at the drop ceilings, looking at whether the drop ceiling would uh, do any value to the fire, uh, in other words, fire protection of, of that, uh, and it, it really didn't matter. I mean, it went right through the fireproofing of the drop ceilings. Fireproofing and no fireproofing was also evaluated just to see uh, if any of this had an influence on what was going to happen and whether the fire uh, was an issue or not. So the research team, our team, investigated this two ways. We looked, first of all, we, we questioned the NIST model. We questioned it because we wanted to uh, see if we got the same results they got. So we attempted, we t worked very hard to try to simulate exactly what they did in this process. And if we then came up with the same conclusion, then okay, we understand where they're at, and then we would have other questions we'd have to ask. So the UAF models basically uh, looked at their condition, and we also looked at numerous conditions to evaluate the structural response, such as versus fire location, effects of no shear studs. I'm, I realize that I'm saying this over again, but I just want to make sure you fully understand what I'm saying. Uh, fully composite shear studs, non-composite, and then as-built connections versus pin joints or rigid joints. And the reason that's important, I'll show you shortly why that, that's an, a very important idea. Other conditions such as no fire protection, we, we looked at that. We looked at the effects of welded wire fabric in the concrete deck of slabs and the flutes in the stay-in-place forms on the heat transfer through the floor system. There was a discussion about whether that airspace between the steel flange and the um, flute was going to affect any transfer of fire, heat, and, and so forth. So we investigated that. So uh, we also, and whether there was any, any um, fireproofing in that, in that void space. Uh, so that was all examined. The airspace above the drop ceiling was examined for fires above the f uh, floor versus fires below the floor. So, so now let's talk about the NIST results. NIST basically said, okay, here's what's going on. There's debris impact, impacted our, the building, and that then um, knocked some, um, did some damage. And it also uh, caused fire to develop because it came in through the windows and in some floors it produced uh, some fire. So they then uh, looked at uh, and to simulated the uh, f fire by using a fire dynamic analysis program. They also used a structural interface analysis and structural response to fires using ANSYS, which is a well-known finite element program. And they th then did their initial response and prob probable collapse using LS Dyna, very, two very good finite element programs. So those results are based upon those approaches. So, so let's talk about the NIST discussion points for a moment. This is just a, a side view to kind of give you an idea of what this building might look like from the side. So you can see here, uh, there's these side exterior trusses. Uh, this is floor 13, there's floor th 47 up here, and here's the plan view of what that looks like. And so it kind of gives you an idea. This is the north elevation, south elevation, west and east. So that gives you a should give you a mental picture that this is not a, is not a symmetrical structure. And, and quite frankly, it's not equally stiff in all directions. So there's, there's that complexity as well, okay? So basically what happened is there was fires and, and some of the fires uh, produced some issues. And so what we then uh, had to take a look at is, okay, let's start with what NIST said and we're gonna see if we can duplicate their results. So NIST argues that number one, the absence of girder shear studs would have provided that provided uh, lateral restraint uh, and the one side lateral support to the girder provided by the northeast corner floor beams for column 79 uh, 
And they also then said that their failure of girder to column connections were caused primarily by thermal expansion of large span lengths of the northeast floor beams. So we're really talking about the northeast corner now of this structure. So if we're talking about uh, looking at this, uh, this area right in here. Okay. So the NIST conclusions were that fire induced weakening of the critical columns and did not cause uh, the, the WC system to collapse. That was uh, referenced on, in their document. Temperature, so fire induced weakening of the critical columns. What they're saying here is the fire didn't weaken the columns. What caused the problem was the expansion of the beams. So temperature in column 79 was below 200 degrees C. Remember, a movement along the beam axis was caused by sagging is what they said, and lateral displacement of the girder framing into column 79 was a result of thermal expansion of the beams framing into the girder. So, basically, uh, this is kind of what happened. When they started losing uh, lateral support, then it caused a cascade of this initiation starting here and all these losing in verticals lateral support and that caused that to buckle. In reality what we're looking at in plan view is there's your column 79 right here. That's the northeast corner. This entire, this is only a small portion of this huge building. So in plan view I'm only looking at this area and I've got this blue area bracketed out because NIST approximated all the connections in this area uh, as if they were connected and, um, and modeled them as a nonlinear system. But over here, they didn't do that. I don't know if it was because it cost so much time or why they uh, did not, they, maybe they thought that this was not, uh, not necessary. But uh, so, so anyway, that's what they've done. The area of the floor where connections were modeled uh, were in this blue zone for floors 8 to 14. Now what I'm saying here is that they analyzed this using the ANSYS program uh, and they were looking at the micro evaluation of whether these fires could have caused this failure and their, their focus is right now is, is at column 79. Okay. So NIST uh, outside the selected area connection failures were not modeled and they used as fix or pin. So what I'm telling you is they didn't model the connections as they were built. They modeled them as a simplification. And so, uh, and the connections were not modeled in the exterior moment frame either. So again, they treat them as a simplification. Also, a girder was considered to have lost vertical support when its web was no longer supported by the bearing seat. And the bearing seat at column 79 was 11 inches wide. Thus, when the girder end at column 79 had been pushed laterally at least five and a half inches, it was considered to no longer be uh, supported by the bearing seat. So, the NIST results, uh, so here's kind of what's looking, it looks like. Imagine here that we're looking at uh, a, a plan view. This is the girder and column 79 is down here. So there's column 79, and so these beams are pushing that girder over, and so at least five and a half inches was reported in 2008 of how much movement went over there. Uh, they later changed that to 6.25 inches in 2012, uh, and if you notice that this is all bowed outward, there's that girder, but notice this, it's all straight. They're saying that that was infinitely resistive. And uh, that's simply not the case, because that was actually less stiff, actually less stiff out here than this whole area to the, that side of the building. So, so this is a situation where to the right you're looking at their model, to the left is the actual structure coming down. So that kind of gives you an idea whether this model is accurate or not. Okay. So let's take a look at what they're doing in terms of the uh, connections. And I've turned this around from what we were looking at before because we're looking at the other side of the building now. And so, uh, so this is outside selected area connections here are 
considered. And so remember that this came down sooner. It's less stiff. Uh, if they used that in the same model in the um, Dyna as they did in the uh, uh, ANSYS. And there's an indication to think that. So this is kind of the inside scoop of what's actually occurring here. Kind of gives you an idea of how it's coming down. Or take a look at more detail of what they were doing in terms of their analysis. So that's the progressive collapse model that they, that the results of that. So the NIST approach said uh, the, that we had five and a half inches of movement at the girder bearing seat at column 79. Uh, the issues that, that led to that is that non-composite behavior at the main girders because ne they neglected thermal expansion of the concrete slab, uh, separated the connection modeling, and they missed flange stiffeners at that location. So our work, however, uh, looks at structural modeling uh, using two programs. We had quality control uh, by both researchers. We use Abacus to develop nonlinear springs for the entire floor system. Uh, we also treated composite and partially composite. We looked at uh, floors 12 and 13 and looked at the expansion. Uh, we also compared it against SAP 2000 uh, for those floors and also the thermal expansion. And then we also, for progressive collapse later on, we are looking at uh, floors 3 to 47 with SAP 2000 and, and looked at the heat transfer through that. The UAF research approach uh, also involved steel framing, connections, uh, columns, beams, and girders. We looked at that all as nonlinear springs. We substructured the frames and concrete floors to save on computer time. Uh, to give us the same end result. The heat transfer was studied for floor tile over concrete floor with welded wire fabric. I realize that I'm going over this again, but I want to make sure that you clearly understand that we were modeling this floor system, and it's very complicated, uh, and handling it in such a way that we took care of the rebar, we took care of the concrete, we have also took care of the materials, and we evaluated fire protection versus no fire protection against the underside of that thing. Uh, equivalent uh, concrete conductivity expansion uh, was accounted for by considering the fact that we believe dolomite aggregate was used in that area. Uh, welded wire fabric and, and was included and the geometry of the section was included. We then took a look at uh, the connections themselves. This is the connection at column 79 that uh, they're so worried about in terms of, uh, hang on a second, in terms of moving off the, uh, the plate. But uh, they forgot that there was actually stiffeners here. And so and then on the drawings, it actually shows stiffeners. And here you see that that's what was there. And that has a significant impact on the end result. And so here we've included it in our computer model. This is the abacus model of exactly what went on there, accounting for all of the, the bolts and the and the stiffeners and everything else. And through that approach, just kind of give you a snapshot of what we were doing, we said, OK, if we're going to throw all that away and replace it with something else, we've got to replace it with the same thing that it would act like if we removed it. And so what we did is we modeled, uh, this is the floor system using Abacus. Uh, so that's got the, it's got the floor framing in it. It's got the columns in it and it's got the concrete system in it. And it's also got all of the uh, elevator shafts and, and, and also the stairs. So we have then uh, a sample connection that took a look, takes a look at this um, system. And if we replace that, and you can see right here, each one of these connections have a different location on the frame. So this one is here as an example. I'm just kind of giving you an example of what we did. And, and we ended up with a, a load deformation curve for that. And if we throw that away and replace it with that load deformation curve, we can end up with the same result. So that's what we did. Uh, get a mental picture of what, what I'm doing? OK. Then another s simple example of this is we had, this is a simple F connection, basically a shear plate. 
with some wells on it, and we took that, and that's an F connection, and it's located there, and we ended up uh, working that in Abacus as well. And every single one of those is done that way, and then we end up with a moment rotation curve, and, and that's what it kind of looks like under states of stress. And so that, we can always take that ro rotation curve, bring it back to this little condition and look at the details after we've got the results from it, okay? We did the same thing for shear as well for that connection. This is the, the SAP model that we're actually using from three to 47 stories. You're just looking at it from a side view. And so we have um, the, the results of that just for you to take a look at this evening. This is kind of a snapshot of the model uh, material properties we examined. So the steel was an ASTMA572 steel with a yield of 50 KSI. Thermal conductivity, uh, thermal strain, density was all taken from the literature for that particular steel. Uh, the concrete uh, was a 28-day compressive strength, 3,500 PSI. Matter of fact, uh, not all steels in this building was A572. Some of them were A36, or not A36, but at the time, I, th I think it was A36. Got to be careful because this is the date when it was built. You got to go back to when, when it was built and take those materials. And so, we, and we did that. Um, anyway, we got the density, we got the aggregate, and from that we were able to get the properties of that floor system so that when they act together, we were acting, lining them back together properly. So this is kind of taking a snapshot look at the framing of that particular floor system uh, for floor 13. And this is column 79 up here in the northeast corner. The dead load was 5,142 kips, and the movement occurred under a fire was about 1.92 inches, and it moved this way to the east. So, and uh, so anyway, uh, if you take a look at the material response versus temperature uh, for the steel, this is kind of what it looks like for the Young's modulus and the yield strength. And then if we took a look at the column and the temperatures that they received, this is kind of the uh, effective buckling length. And uh, at this column 79 at a temperature of 320, uh, three, uh, 392 degrees Fahrenheit, that's the, com so there's very little loss of strength. Basically, is what that's telling us. The NIST fire studies were used, and we also compared against our, our normal uh, solution. This is at uh, floor 13 up here. These are degrees C. And so we took, uh, there was a number of fire models that they had based upon fires in different locations of the building, and we, looked at, we took the worst ones so that we could actually see if this could be a problem. We did the same thing in floor 12. And then um, we used the abacus to look at the structural expansive movements, and then we came back and compared that with SAP. So we have a SAP model just similar to this. Um, looking in plan view, this is what that system looks like in the finite element model if you look down on top of it. These are basically the conditions of the states of stress over here, and this is column 79. All right, that's not so significant to worry about. What is interesting is to take a look at the fact that this actually moved back, I'm sorry, that this actually moved to the, to the right. 1.85 inches at column 79 for floor 13, uh, which is in the opposite direction that NIST movement towards, using the same models that we could come up with for theirs, okay? And then I'll just kind of uh, give you a snapshot of that Looking in plan view, this is the members that were actually experiencing th vertical movements, and this is the, the girder that was sitting there, and there's column 79 down here at the bottom. On the, and so we're on the very far east side of this building. Okay. Floor 12, similar kind of thing. Uh, there's column 79 again. And so kind of taking a quick snapshot of all of this, I don't know if it, uh, hopefully it gives you a, a snapshot of an understanding. But our SAP analysis gives, a, gives us 1.92 inches to the right under these fires. Abacus gives us 1.85 inches to the right of these fires. 
NIST was 6.25 inches to the left. So that can sh shows you the difference between our results and theirs. Kind of give you a comparative study of what was actually going on. Uh, under, under our floor framing, we had steel s connection springs for the entire floor. But, but NIST, remember, only had par part of that floor with their springs in. In other words, they modeled this, the connections uh, they model the connections over only a portion of the floor. The rest of them, they simplified it. The exterior framing connection included springs by us, but they did not. They took them as a rigid system, as I understand it. It looks like it, it didn't move any. Girder to column, and, and by the way, our exterior frames moved out about five and a half inches, not the other way around. Girder to column stiffener plates at column 79. Uh, we included ours and they were on the drawings. They did not. Floors compositely with beams and not girders. We uh, included it and they also included it. Um, floors composite with beams and girders. We included it. They did not. So we're looking at, when I say we included it, we looked at it both ways. We're trying to give everything the benefit of the doubt. So uh, on the floors composite with beams and girders, uh, they did not. We did thermal expansion of the concrete deck. We included it. They did not. I don't know how you can have a concrete floor and not have it expanding. So uh, we also and, and consider it as part of the system. Even if it's not connected with stiffener, uh, with shear connectors, there's also friction. And so we considered the frictional component when we put that away, and we also neglected it. Uh, so the thermal horizontal movement at column 79 was ba basically, NIST was uh, five and a half. If you read the 2008, if you do 2012, it was 6.25. Ours was less than two inches. So UAS, UAF based on NIST column temperatures column did not buckle under gravity loading. Is basically, we've looked at that as well. So our conclusions are, that the concrete diaphragm stiffness is significant, and even with no shear connectors, frictional resistant thermal expansion is not trivial. Item two, thermal expansion of the concrete deck cannot be ignored, and it's likely less than steel. The value is highly dependent upon the type of aggregate. So assuming that the aggregate that they used in this job, and I can't be sure that that's true, but I have, think it's a high probability that dolomite was probably a pretty accurate aggregate at the time. We, we have a pretty good handle on what that uh, thermal expansion and thermal conductivity of that ma material should have been. The research team evaluated fire by considering airspace below beams in the space between the drop ceiling and the structural steel framing. We also considered the result is that the fire underneath will likely burn through that drop ceiling very quickly so you don't get any protection. Uh, and it's resistant to heat transfer is likely not available to help. We also looked at um, the NIST vertical collapse was not consistent with that of the, of the actual collapse. And so the difference uh, was primarily influenced by not modeling a significant portion of the structural framing connection details. Uh, it appears that that was probably the most likely cause of that. So what's next? Well, we're finalizing springs at every floor for SAP the SAP 2000 model. We will conduct progressive collapse by, caused by various conditions. One of those things I'm looking at is the failure at the substation level. Nobody's at really addressed that question. I'm addressing it. I, even if it's not appropriate, we're going to look at it and say it's either appropriate or not appropriate. At the end of the day, I don't want anybody to come back and say, well, you didn't look at this or you didn't look at that. We're going to look at, try to look at everything. So we are looking at whether there was anything there that may have caused a, uh, a loss of support at that level. Uh, we are also going to look at the shock waves imposed by the falling debris by Towers 1 and 2 and whether that imposed any form of um, damage to, to World Trade Center 7. We are looking at that. We're also looking at the radiant heat from the, from the uh, Towers 1 and 2 and its influence on the building exterior in terms of heat transfer and what that might have done to the structure. Now, I'm not going to say that I believe everything is important here. I'm saying we're going to investigate them. 
And the reason we're going to investigate them because I know people are going to say, well, why didn't you investigate this? So we, we're, going to, we're going to put it on the table and investigate it. We're also examining the building's response to various columns being taken out. Right now, uh, I can tell you that we've already started looking at uh, progressive collapse of, column, of, of, of World Trade Center 7. We've been doing it for about two weeks now. Uh, initially, we've had a lot of difficulties making this work. We, we are now very, very pleased at, at some of our results. So right now, in our, in our models, we're looking at the nonlinear response, meaning that when it begins to bend, it's going to, it doesn't have a limit. So we're, say, we're saying that. And that's at the connections, and also in the materials. In other words, when the beam uh, exceeds its what we call the yield, yield value, it can go ahead and deform without any resistance, pretty much. And so we're, we've got account, that accounted for. What we don't have accounted for in our models yet are all the connections that we want to have in there, and nor do we have the what's called a large geometric theory, uh, which basically, when it gets really, really, really big, the interaction between its resistance to carry load and its ability to carry load before that happened is significantly less. So that's going to be handled uh, very shortly. And also the column buckling. Every, every column that has the ability to uh, carry load also has the ability to buckle. And so we need to, we're looking at that. So right now I can tell you this. Our preliminary findings are, which I guess I shouldn't have been surprised by because I thought all along that this building is not going to come down symmetrically, uh, is it's now leaning to the west as it's coming down. And, that, uh, and that's by taking out the inner core columns at floor eight. So that's, that's the beginning. We're also going to take out the uh, series of columns that were taken out by NIST and see if we get what kind of result we get from that. Uh, I, it, that will be pretty informative because what that will begin to tell us is whether the building could have collapsed like we see or whether it didn't. Okay? So keep in mind that that column 79 is not in the middle of the building. It's at the northeast corner. Okay? So what do I have to offer you this evening? Did building 7 collapse from fire? And my answer to that is no. This is based upon all of our calculations, and we have no indication whatsoever that it, it could be remotely possible for that to have happened. So that's where I'm at. Thank you. You're welcome.